I'm Kay Daigle of Beyond Ordinary Women Ministries. I'd like you to welcome you to this video and podcast episode of sexual identity and gender, gender identity. We have as our special guests two very special people who have studied this. They know what they're talking about, and I do not. So I'm here to ask questions, and they are here to provide some answers and to got some guidance for us. Um, Sandra Gawn, Dr. Sandra Gawn is with us. Uh, Sandy is a professor at Dallas Seminary. She is a professor of media arts and worship. Uh, she is also an author, journalist, and speaker. Welcome, Sandy. You've been here before, and we always appreciate it when you're able to come. I'd love sharing with your listeners. We also have today our very first man doing one of our uh, episodes for you. So we are very honored to have Dr. Gary Barnes with us today. He is professor of counseling ministries at Dallas Seminary. He is also an ordained minister and a licensed psychologist. He has a lot of things as, as Sandy does as well. And I would just encourage you to go to beyondordinarywomen.org and look at their bios to learn more about them. But these are just some of the highlights of their, um, their expertise and their years of ministry. So welcome to both of you. Thank you for being part of this. Uh, this topic is huge and we're just going to be able to step our foot as, and just wade into it just a little bit today, I think. And it is, it is such a hot topic that I know that many of us, like me, feel a little bit lost in all of the terminology as well as what to do about it, what to, how to, how to respond to people, how to love people well who are made in the image of God. So let's get started. Um, let, me, let me turn to, let me just ask either one of you to just define a few terms for us before we get started so that we're clear what's the difference in sexuality and gender. Um, how do we understand that? Go for it, Dr. Barnes. Okay. Uh, yeah, I think, uh, first of all, let me just say thank you very much, Kay, for letting us be with you. And I didn't even realize what a special privilege I had of being the first man to join the podcast. So I'll, I'll try to do a good job. Uh, so another man might have another possibility in the future. Perhaps you, you have blazed the trail. Yeah, maybe, maybe so. <laughs> Uh, it, it is a really good starting point to say, what, what are we really meaning when we talk about sexual identity? And what are we meaning when we talk about gender identity? And, and is there a difference? And is that an important difference? And so uh, very simply, uh, I think it's helpful to think about wh whenever we're talking about sexual identity, well, we're talking about someone's sexual preference in terms of their sexual attraction, their sexual orientation, and that would be how durable that attraction is, persistent it is. And then also what they end up coming to in terms of how they view themselves in terms of their sexual identity related to their sexual attractions. And so we can have um, heterosexual identity. I'm, I'm attracted to the opposite sex. Uh, we, we use the term homosexual orientation or attraction. Uh, and that would be, I'm attracted to the same sex. And we also have bisexual orientation or attraction. And that would be, I, I'm sexually attracted to both male and female. Okay. okay. So that's, that's really what we're talking about when we're talking about sexual identity. Uh, when we talk about gender identity, uh, it's, um, it's not specifically in reference to what their sexual attractions are. It's about how they view themselves in terms of male or female. 
And so when a person has their biological sex as one indicator, and then they have their view of themselves as different from their biological sex, then that becomes a thing that creates a conflict on what my gender identity is. And the, the difficulty of being in that struggle, we would refer to as gender identity dysphoria. It creates an unsettledness with me. It's not a sense of congruence for me. Okay, what is the difference between just a gender role and a gender identity? And, and Sandy, you might want to talk about this because mm -hmm. you and I talked about gender roles before. And I just want to be sure that everybody understands the difference. Well, and not everybody means the same thing when they use the terms and, and the terms are changing all the time. So uh, in general, in general, it helps to use sex to refer to biologically male and female and gender to refer to masculinity or femininity and the spectrum of that, the social outworking of your biological identity in very simple terms. Um, and so we also have to look at the difference between a, a self-description and a label. I'm a professor and I can make that my identity, but it doesn't, it's not necessarily my identity uh, any more than a chef's identity is rooted in being a chef. It could just be a word used to describe, but it could also be on a spectrum. And this is where Dr. Barnes, I think has, he's my colleague and a beloved brother, and I'm glad to have him with us today. And he, I think he, he does a really great job of explaining sort of a spectrum of how that all happens. So you're on Dr. Barnes. You're on. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So uh may, maybe just so i'm really uh following up on the pitch could you like restate what i'm following up on let me start with it with a story okay so my husband and i went through 10 years of infertility and pregnancy loss and people would say you're infertile and i'd say no i'm not infertile i'm just having trouble getting pregnant and they laughed because that's the definition of infertility but in my mind it was a spectrum I was just going to the doctor having trouble getting pregnant. I hadn't changed my plans for the future. I hadn't enrolled in a master's program because I wasn't going to be a mom. I was still making plans to be a mom. So in my brain, I had not taken on an identity of an infertile person. It was just my experience of infertility. And it took some years of working through that. And, and so there was a difference between a label and an identity. And mm. that's where I think you you have some pretty okay. helpful terminology okay. to help us understand that spectrum of how that happens. Yes, yes. And uh, really everything I've learned about this, I've pretty much borrowed from others and especially Mark Yarhouse. And so uh, Mark Yarhouse has a wonderful model that I think is very helpful on this. He refers to it as the three-tier model. And it's it's emphasizing this process that happens over time, like Dr. Glahn is describing, this is very much a process over time. And it, it's very helpful to nuance it so we understand like the different tiers rather than just lumping everything together, see? And so uh, the way Dr. Uh, Dr. Yarhouse would explain it is, Tier one is the time period that's typically happening around puberty. And during this time, we begin to experience what our sexual attractions are in more of a new, different, and even more intense way. And so this is tier one would be described as uh, my sexual attractions. And so for a subset of people, this time period becomes noticeably different from most of the other people around them. 
and they begin to experience that I am not attracted to the other sex. I'm attracted to the same sex. And so it's very important at this tier one stage that we understand it just as tier one because a very common and unfortunate problem is at the moment that somebody's experiencing same-sex attraction, they automatically jump down to tier three and conclude what their sexual identity is. And it's way too soon for anybody to be able to do that. See, so we have to, we have to allow for a lot of time. Uh, I, I use the term, the, the cake's still baking. And we have to give it time to bake because at this point in time, even though we're describing your real experience of same-sex attraction, at this point in time, we don't know what that's going to mean for later. For most people, it's going to take them like a 10 to 15 year time period to get to that sexual identity synthesis where they can say, this is really who I am in terms of my sexual attractions. And wouldn't you say in that early stage, sometimes the labeling comes from without. So you confide in somebody you have same sex attraction and they pull out the labels and say, this is what you are. And you start living into that. That's very unfortunate when that happens. But it also happens uh, just because individuals don't know better, they just automatically think if I'm having this experience right now, then the cake's already fully baked. And so this is who I am, just because this is what my experience is right now. So it could happen in either direction. Uh, both are <laughs> unfortunate. Um, so it, it really puts an Im great importance on us as the church and also as parents, that we also don't jump ahead two tiers when somebody's experiencing that first tier one experience. Absolutely. So what would tier two be? So tier two, so in tier one, we're using descriptive language. I'm just describing what my experience is. I do have sexual attractions in this direction. I don't have sexual attractions in this direction. We're only describing, and that's really helpful when everybody's using descriptive language at tier one. At tier two, we're actually moving from descriptive to evaluative language. And that means we've given this enough time to evaluate that the direction of my sexual attraction is persistent, strong, and durable enough to be labeled as an orientation. In other words, it's not going back and forth. My sexual attractions are oriented in this direction. And, and that's the, the cake's already cooked long enough to know that's where it is. It's not a back and forth thing. And then so that would be tier two. And then, then what's tier three? And then tier three would be after I've made it through tier two and I'm, I'm really established on this is a orientation. Uh, it, it's persistent, durable, and strong that this is where it is. Then I have the decision time. Uh, and so this is where I take on an identity. So people can get to tier two and have a same sex orientation in terms of my sexual attractions, but then they still have lots of other choices that they're going to make in terms of the lifestyle that they live and also how they identify themselves. And so tier three is all about identity and lifestyle. What we would say and this is a really important distinction for parents and church folk to grasp, is at this point in time, we would, based on our understanding of causes, we would say we're not clear 
there's not strong scientific evidence to say. We know that there's many factors. There's genetic factors, hormonal factors, developmental factors, social factors, cultural factors, and even some of the developmental factors could be going on in utero. So it's, it's like a big algorithm with lots of variables in it. But the thing that even makes it more complicated is for different individuals, different variables have different weights. Wow. And so we're, we're not at all clear about causes of same-sex attraction and causes of same-sex orientation. What we are clear about is that people do have choices at tier three about the identity they choose to take on and about the lifestyles that they choose to live. Most people, we would say with high confidence, most people, but not all people, don't have choices at tier one or tier two. It's just based on their feelings. Is that right? Well, we, we can't really say for sure what it's based on. We're just saying that it's real and that for most people, it's not something that they're choosing. Tier one and tier two. Tier three, that's different. That's when we're talking about choices in terms of lifestyle and identity. So you can choose a celibate lifestyle but still not expect to be, quote, delivered. Uh, can you explain yes. that a little bit? Yeah, yes. So that's one of the choices. That's not the only choice. Um, some people say, because my same-sex attractions are persistent, durable, and strong over time, and I don't expect these to change, then I don't want to live alone. So I'm going to choose to have same sex relationships. Other people say, well, I would like to be in relationship with one special person, but I'm not going to have heterosexual uh, attractions. So it's also not congruent with my faith to have same-sex relationships. So I'm going to choose to be living a celibate life. So my identity then could still use many different labels. People aren't using all the same labels when they make this choice. Uh, some people say my primary identity is a Christian, but I still as a Christian, I have same-sex attractions, but I'm going to choose to not live in same-sex relationships. I'm going to choose a celibate life. Other people might get to that similar point and say, well, um, this is going to be my orientation. That's not going to change. And I, I'm because of my faith, I'm choosing not to also live in same-sex relationships but perhaps there could be another person that would live with me in a heterosexual relationship and even have a family together, but without the expectation that we would both share heterosexual sexual attraction. Mm -hmm. So that's another choice. That I'm people. glad you brought that up because I have a friend in that situation. Yeah, I've worked with yeah. many couples yeah. who've made that choice. Yeah. If people do make that choice, and I honor that choice, but you'd want to be sure that both people are having a really good understanding ahead of time of what that's going to look like and what that's going to involve for both people. It's a very difficult thing when that comes up after both people have said, I do, and it's never been talked about. Yeah. These, these are hard and that happens do. as well. Yeah. Well, what about the person who has the same sex attractions? Is that a sin that they've just had these attractions? This is a great question. Is it a sin to be tempted? <laughs> yeah. It's a sin to lust. 
to, you know, we read in the Bible, the process of that, you have a desire, but the desire uh, is, isn't a sin, but if you act on it or you let your mind objectify on it, that's a totally different thing. Uh, what's the old adage that you can let the birds fly by? You just can't let them make a nest in your hair. <laughs> right. Luther gave us that one. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Well, and that, I mean, what you just described is true for heterosexuals as well. Exactly. You Definitely. Know? And sometimes we miss that point. Yes. Right. It, it is for all of us that, yeah. So, okay. I think, I think that's really very helpful. Um, Gary and Sandy, either one, maybe both of you, what can we as the church do to better support our brothers and sisters um, that, have same-sex attraction uh, or even same-sex orientation? What, yes. what can we do? I'll start with a couple. Um, one is to not say when you get married, da, 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 but if you get married. Um, looking at the church's calendar and the church's announcement and uh, announcements and, and are we communicating that mature adulthood is marriage and children? Mm -hmm. Uh, that would mean not trying to fix, fix your friends up unless they want to be fixed up. And I did have a woman in my adult Bible fellowship who put out the word, hey, if you know somebody, you know, feel free to introduce me, which I appreciated because I didn't know, uh, you know, I had some guys in mind, but I wasn't going to match make. Um, but also not everybody wants that or appreciates that. And we should never treat uh, the social narrative like that's the norm. That's what's expected. Um, I think that even something like Advent, when you have different families coming up, that you have a single person come up and do the Advent wreath or, you know, read scripture or whatever, that, that families of one, in a sense, are represented in your church. Also, a really robust theology of friendship and that in community. So if you have single people in your congregation, you're inviting them, us, if, if we're single, you know, sit with us, join our family, be part of our extended family. Here's my house key. You are not alone in this world. Those, those are a few I would throw out. Yeah, those are awesome. I fully endorse all those. Um, I, I think a very first big thing that parents and church folk can do is when a young adolescent is doing their first step of, as they say, coming out or saying, hey, I don't have same-sex attract. I mean, I don't have heterosexual sexual attractions. I have same-sex attractions that nobody freaks out. Yeah. And uh, that we actually move towards rather than moving away or, or even moving against. And uh, so often it's a moving away or moving against response. Uh, we're moving away because we don't know what to do with it, or we're moving against because we think we can control it. And, and as part of that, recognizing, wouldn't you say that that healthy touch is really important? You don't yes. want to all of a sudden make somebody the untouchables. Right. Uh, if a woman confides in me that she has same-sex attraction, that doesn't mean I can't ever hug her again. Right. In the same way, just because she has same-sex attraction doesn't mean she's attracted to me. Right. Uh, yeah. And so it can feel like, you know, touch is a human thing. We all need touch and particularly our singles. And so it can feel ostracizing in a sort of silent, unspoken way as well. Yes, yes. So it's so easy for a person either with against responses or away responses to end up isolated in this long journey that they're going to need to be in. So we need to give them the opposite message of moving towards them and say, hey, this is going to be a journey, but we're with you. We're in the journey with you. The second thing that I think will make the most difference after you get past the first thing is to say, let's make our primary focus for all of us, not just you, but including you, to be our growth and development in our individual identities in Christ. Mm -hmm. How do we all support that? 
And then the third point would be to say, we're, go we're just going to take a watchful waiting approach on the direction of your sexual identity. And, and that's not going to be a thing that we're going to ignore or a thing that we're going to try to control. Uh, and, and so if we, I think if we can kind of do those things together, you're going to provide the best possible playing field or platform or foundation for whatever the future is going to be on that. So often, and I've seen this over and over again, where both parents and church complicate rather than facilitate this process that people are going to have to go through. And, and as part of that, we had a, a, a seminary where we teach, um, a student did her doctoral research on the parents of uh, kids who are same-sex attracted who have come out, or, or young adults, or older adults. And the experience, particularly of the mothers uh, in this research, was that they too felt ostracized. They mm. too felt shunned. They too felt like people didn't know what to say to them. So they said nothing. Um, and so it, it really the whole family was affected uh, in ways we just don't necessarily think about. That's a great point. Yes. Yeah, we just, we, we have trouble loving people when they aren't like us. And the church is, has been very afraid of these kinds of, uh, situations I think in the past and, and so all of us as parents have have been very afraid because yeah. that's that's the sense we have received from the church and and other people I think. don't you think that it's essential for those of us in leadership to also make sure that we don't elevate this topic as like the sin issue and, and, you know, Dorothy Sayers said something about the, the other six deadly sins um, and just the, I, the idea that greed and pride and, you know, anger can so destroy relationships. But we we have our pet sins that we just think are sort of the untouchables. And 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 to clarify, we're not necessarily talking about somebody having sinned here. Right. right. Like right. somebody asked me this week, why does the Bible say homosexuality is a sin? It it doesn't. Right. Right. Yeah. Same sex actions. Well, that's such a great point. See, that's why we need this nuanced three-tier model, because once you understand that, you understand that the question is homosexuality a sin. Uh, it's a nonsense question. W what do we really mean by that? See? Talk Are we talking attraction? about tier one and two where people aren't making choices, but they still have this attraction? Well, I can't really consider that a sin. What about tier three? Well, depends on what choices you're making in tier three. See, so it really needs to be way more of a nuanced question as well as answer. That's good. Well, let's let's move for just a minute because there are other um sexual identities that are confusing to people. What about intersex? What is that? And how does that differ from what we're talking about with homosexual identity? Yes. So that's one of many terms that we would not include in the sexual identity category, but we would put that in the gender identity category. So, so you can have XXY chromosomes, right? So they're actually born with an extra chromosome. Well, no, I mean, that is just one tiny subset of, uh, it, it could be uh, ambiguous genitalia, which can have a huge sliding scale of options. Um, Gary, you look like you're looking up something. Yeah, I just was going to look at my formal definition of intersex. Oh, right. It. And so uh, what I have for that is this is a term that describes conditions in which a person is born with sex characteristics or anatomy 
that does not allow them to be identified clearly as male or female. It can be chromosomal, could be gonadal, could be genital. Mm -hmm. So the, uh, Dr. Barnes and I co-teach a course in sexual ethics, and I tend to do the media communications part of it, and he's doing the counseling part of it. And we see ourselves as curators bringing in experts. But one of the assignments in that course is just watch a video by a Christ follower who is intersex. And I would say a huge percentage of our students leave the comment, I had no idea this even existed. Mm -hmm. I, I didn't either until much later in life. In fact, I was doing my uh, doctoral work for psychology and was doing my clinical psychology internship at NYU Medical Center. And my very first case as a psychology intern was a person who had male and female genitals. Mm -hmm. Your very first case. My very first case. Okay, in my then. <laughs> wow. Wow. Didn't even know it existed before that. Yeah. So well, I, I think for many years, didn't they, maybe the doctor that delivered the baby would just make a choice mm -hmm. and determine what this child was going to be? Hope it was a good guess. That yeah, was a common some, practice. There's some resentment around that, as you can imagine. Yes. Um, and, and it's also one of the reasons why it's not always helpful to cite he made them male and female, uh, because he made them male and female in the garden in a perfect state. Uh, that's not to say that you're imperfect uh, if, if you are intersex, but it does mean that the, the Old Testament uh, garden narrative was not a physiology textbook. And we have to be careful that we don't cite good theology as, uh, as a physiology textbook because it can be painful. I, I can give an example of, of how that happened again with our infertility. So uh, be fruitful and multiply was a, was a commandment given in this state, right in the garden. And I couldn't be fruitful and multiply in a biological sense and so there were those who told me buy a maternity top to demonstrate your faith because you you must be in a state of sin if you're not able to reproduce because Genesis mm -hmm. says you can. Um, right. And Genesis says you're male or female. It's like, yeah, mm -hmm. Jesus also said some are born eunuchs. <laughs> so, you know, we can talk later maybe about what that means, but it certainly opens up the some ambiguity. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Really and is. what what Dr. Glan's saying right now, I think, is really a, a big tendency in our faith communities is whenever we're observing a problem, we automatically attach the cause of that as a personal sin choice. Absolutely. Now, we could say that really any problem, including a, an appendicitis attack, is ultimately a result of sin, but not all problems are a result of personal sin choices. Mm -hmm. yeah. Right. Yeah. All creation yeah. groans, but that doesn't mean... All creation groans under the effects yeah. of sin. Yeah. Things aren't as they should be because yeah. of sin, but that's not always because of personal sin okay. choices. Who sinned, the man or his parents? <laughs> Jesus. Yes. Neither one in this case. Yeah. That's right. So how do we view this, Dr. Borns? How do, how, do we, how do we view what's going on? How do we view homosexuals? How do we, what, what should our perspective be here? Well, I think first and foremost, we, we have to take a humble, teachable approach. There could be a lot about this I don't know or understand. And I have to be willing to learn and understand. But uh, I, I think regardless of what my level of understanding is, I do understand enough that the compelling love of Christ in my life should be compelling me in love to move towards others who aren't like me. Rather than moving away, 
or moving against, the compelling love of Christ compels me to move towards. I, I, in order to do that, I'm going to have to embrace a model that says oneness not based on sameness. We don't have to be the same in order for me to move towards and connect with you. And every Christian should be compelled to do that because when we were not like Christ, even adversarial to him, what did he do? He moved towards us at his expense. Romans 15, 7, receive others as you have been received by Christ. So that'd be my short answer, Kay, to your question. Yeah, I love that. I think, I think that's very wise and I appreciate your sharing that. Let's move for at least a few minutes to transsexuality. I mean, this might be the biggest question that I'm receiving these days of other Christians that are wondering what, you know, what do I do when, you know, this or that is the situation and somebody I love, somebody I know, maybe they're getting married, maybe, maybe it's trans, you know, what do we do with our children where they're hearing all this you know, you have to call kids different pronouns now. You have to be so careful. Um, so let's talk about that for just a few minutes. What is a transsexual and what light can you shine on this? Yeah. Well, just for the sake of definition, let me read you my formal definition on that. So transsexual is a person who believes he or she was born in the wrong body or the other sex and wishes to transition or has transitioned through hormonal treatment or and sex reassignment surgery. Right. So incongruence. Yes. The incongruence has been so strong that they've taken action to try to get a sense of congruence. So wouldn't you say there's this, in the same way that we've just been talking about with same-sex attraction, there's a spectrum of identity here? A, a same thing. And we would have to also say the same thing that we still don't have a clear understanding of what the explanation to all of that is. And it can be different variables in a big algorithm that also have different weights for different individuals. And I know that the the, tre the three trans people I know, uh, in no in none of those cases are they wanting to conform to what they think is cool. They are sad about it. They're begging God to take it away. Would you say that's been a lot of your experience? Well, that's the the difference between a person who has gender dysphoria and a person who still feels like there's an incongruence, but they may not have dysphoria about the incongruence. See, so the dysphoria part is the conflict that comes from it, the distress that comes from it. Um, the reason I brought that up is because somebody asked me recently, aren't they just trying to be cool? I mean, isn't yeah, it just cool yeah, yeah. to be different now? It's and a terrible experience to be in the middle of. Um, you don't have a sense of personal peace, but then you're not, you're not congruent with not only yourself, but with everyone around you, <laughs> except for maybe the very sub community of people who are going through the very same thing you're going through. Which would seem like all the more reason why we as a Christian community have to come around so that the only voices exactly. they're hearing can't be about that subject, right? Exactly. And that's, that's the reason why one of my favorite Mark Yarhouse quotes is, we should be referring to this as our people, not those people. That's because really it is us. It is mm -hmm. among us. Right? Mm -hmm. They are our people. Yeah. 
Okay. That's a good. There are people made in the image of God and they have feelings and they have, as you said, a whole lot of hurt goes with, especially the transsexual situation. I think it's, it's just um, got to be a lot of loneliness mm-hmm. and sadness in my mind. Wouldn't you, Dr. Barnes, and, and well, how would you advise you? So you have a parent of a 12 year old. Yes. Who's saying, you know, my breasts are starting to come in and I don't want them. I want surgery. Right. Isn't there some clarity on advice on that one? Yeah, I have like a five point plan I give okay. parents in that situation because okay. it's a reoccurring situation. Okay. And then I also have like Mark's three lens model that I think is helpful for them to carry with it. But but point one on the five point plan is uh, don't, don't react. And especially don't react with very rigid gender stereotypes. Like you will wear a pink dress. <laughs> yes. Okay. You're you going to have to, it, you might have to move more in your own discomfort zone but you're trying to facilitate the best working model for what you're having to work with. And so rigid gender stereotypes are only gonna be met with opposition uh, rather than a facilitating process, okay? Um, the, the second thing that I would say is I, I would want you to kind of borrow the language of let's navigate this terrain together. We're in a journey. Again, our language. Uh, yes. Okay. We're, we actually are going to have to give this time. And we want to journey together. We want to navigate this terrain together. And during this time, we want to take a watchful waiting approach. So the the two opposite approaches to that would be we're shutting this down right now so it never has a chance. Or we're going to facilitate this right now so you're going to be ready later on. The harder choice, but of course, the better choice, I believe, is we're not going to do either one of those two things. We're we're going to be in this limbo zone for quite a while. And we're going to take a watchful waiting approach. And we're going to be kind of flexible during this time period. So I might be a little more flexible on your dress style, on your hairstyle, maybe even on nicknames that you want to use. But we're not going to jump to these more radical things that in some cases might even be irreversible strategies that get taken. Okay, so that'd be point number two. Um, Point number three is uh, like we talked about before, we we wanna try to continue to use descriptive language uh, rather than prescriptive language. What do you mean by that? Like, instead of saying, I am. Let's both talk about what your experiences are like rather than labeling prematurely what your identity is. You are. That's giving a prescriptive label on this. And didn't I just see something like in the last month that sort of hit the general market that something uh, that said that people who are given a label are more likely to grow into the label? Than those who yeah, are not that, given a label? Yes, that, that's a very um, big influencer in, in the journey. And then what the label does is it promotes behaviors, and then the label and the behaviors together kind of prematurely form an identity. That's a premature identity. See? Yeah. Uh, and that's very, very important because... If you, uh, if you just look at the numbers, the Diagnostic Statistical Manual, DSM-5, last published in 2013, uh, gives the prevalence rates for males and for females of gender dysphoria. And uh, for males, 
it's 0.014% or 5 to 14 out of 100,000 for adult males. And for women, it's less. It's 0.002% to 0.003% or 2 to 3 out of 100,000 for adult females. Now, the numbers for the children is much, much higher. So what does that tell you? Some of them will outgrow. Most will or develop. don't develop. end up where they're starting. So if you start doing surgery early on <laughs> and they might just outgrow it. You're adding problems on top of problems. Yeah. See, that's why the watchful waiting approach is it's very hard to do that, I admit. But that's, that's your wisest approach mm -hmm. to this. So point number four, I would say, is, is to grow your supports. And that's supports for the individuals, supports for the family, especially the parents. Uh, we, I have a student right now who is uh, working on his doctorate who's building a parent uh, support program for churches to mm -hmm. use oh, for this. Wow, and so... Right. We'll uh, be hopeful that that's a, a good tool that can maybe be available and spread to, to more churches. Mm -hmm. uh, but then point number five, and we talked about this already with sexual identity, is all along the way, while you're doing watchful waiting, you're going to join together on all of us growing. What's it mean to grow our identity in Christ together, regardless of what we think in terms of our gender identity, our, our primary focus, and, and we're going to just kind of do a wait and see what happens on the gender identity, but we're not going to do a wait and see on the identity in Christ. We're, we're going to grow that right now to, to the max that we can. And it's, it's not unique to you. I need to do that myself. So let's all yeah. do that together. Can we make a point of clarification here, though? I had a, a student who said, I am not primarily a man. I am my first identity. My first identity is a Christian. I'm like, well, it's not either or. Right. <laughs> yeah. Like, Can you just talk a little bit about like, it seems like sometimes if someone is describing their experience, we as believers sometimes say, well, you're making something else your identity and your first identity is that of we we automatically assume they have a wrong prioritizing of identity if that makes sense right Can you speak to that a minute right so uh maybe i'm not fully capturing what what your question is dr glenn but my i would say for every single person no matter who you are what you do what the goal would be is to grow my identity in christ as my primary identity. Yeah. And I can do that regardless of any of the other identities I'm I'm working with. Yeah. I I think what I where I need to make a distinction is the difference between a primary identity or an either or identity. He was oh, saying okay. I can I'm either a Christian or a man. I can't oh, okay. it's like No, no, you know, no. Your Christian identity is your primary identity, yeah. but you might It transcends all other. Yeah. And okay. so all your choices are going to be funneled through that yes. priority, right? Uh, but it doesn't mean you're not a woman or a man or a right. person with same-sex attraction. or yeah. name and, and what we're not trying to say by growing your identity in Christ is um, that you won't have a struggle in your gender identity. We're not, we're not saying that. Or we're not other, saying that, that heals all other... Right. Yeah. Just like a just like a sexual identity. Right. Yeah. Thanks. That's good. Now, do you want to talk about the lenses also, or did you? Well, I think that would be helpful you? if if you think we have time for that. I don't, let's go for it. Okay. So again, this is from Mark Yarhouse, and what he's saying is there we have kind of evolved in a response to dealing with this growing awareness of, of gender identity as a struggle, we, we tend to have two primary lenses that we look through. 
and especially people of faith, but not limited to people of faith, are prone to look through a lens that, that we would call the integrity lens. And that's the, uh, the model or the lens that would say there's extreme importance on the binary model. And we can't lose the binary model. We have to keep male and female. It's got to be one or the other. That we have to maintain the integrity of the binary model. And uh, the important thing from a faith-based position of uh, embracing the binary model is the fact that we're all created in the image of God, and God does have theological significance in creating male and female. So we, we don't want to do away with the theological significance of that binary model in the original design, the theological significance of that as we reflect God's image as male and as we reflect God's image as female. Okay. Good. So that's the good news about the integrity model. But it's really built on Genesis 1 and 2. It's not taking into account Genesis 3 and following. So that becomes the problem with just sticking strictly with the binary model. In reaction to the binary model, uh, people are embracing the diversity model. And, and there's also many people from a faith-based position that are also embracing the diversity model. And so the, the diversity model is trying to emphasize the importance of all humans, that all humans have dignity. And even if you don't fit the binary model of male or female, that doesn't mean you have less dignity. It doesn't mean that you should not be equally celebrated. And many people also from a faith-based position would say, because you are created in the image of God, regardless of whether you're demonstrating the binary model or not, that because you're created in God's image, you should be celebrated and embraced and included. Okay, so that's the good thing about the diversity model is it's calling us to celebrate and include, but the limitation or the downfall of the diversity model is that they do that at the exclusion of the binary model. And they say there's, there's no valid place for a binary model. We have to do away with the binary model in order to celebrate and include. The third lens is what I would refer to as the anomaly lens. Uh, Mark Yarhouse had a different name for it, but I, I like the, the word anomaly. And that's going back to the verse that Dr. Glan identified earlier about we're in a whole different situation from Genesis 3 on. And that is the whole world groans under sin. And not every problem is a result of a personal sin choice. Now, there could be people in the gender uh, debates that are involving personal sin choices. We're not saying that that's not possible, but what we are saying is not everybody in the gender struggle is there because of personal sin choices. And so we have to allow for anomalies. We have to allow for things don't go according to design, and it's not always because of personal sin choices. And therefore, we do need to celebrate and include those who don't fit the binary model. But at the same time, we don't do that by getting rid of the binary model, because there's important theological significance attached 
to God creating male and female in his image. So those are the three lenses. And I would say the to the extent that the faith community can embrace that third lens, we will be so better equipped to really bear God's image as we love and include those who aren't fitting the binary model. Thank you. I'm glad. I'm glad you went forward and were able to share all of that. I think that's very important. Um, we will have. Um, hopefully, can can is that something that we can have as like a handout to send to people? I, I know you you got some of this from some other people, but we would just give it away free on our website. Yes, I, um, I believe I uh, sent a PowerPoint that includes yes. these slides. And there, so there's, a, there's one specific slide for the three-tier model, and there's also a specific slide for the three-lens model. And uh, you would be free to extend that to those wanting that. Great. We also uh, have some other resources that you have you the two of you have mentioned that we can put on our website as well so that people can um, buy books or whatever whatever you know the resource is and if you're interested in those things you can go to our website beyondordinarywomen.org choose resources from the menu and scroll down to to helpful resource list and it will be part of our helpful resource list, but also in the media list that is also down on the menu, you can, you can look at all of our um, resources like this by title of the video and podcast episode. So you could find this with uh, the sexual identity and general gender identity um, video on the list as well. Or contact us. If you can't find them, just contact me and I'll be happy to send it to you if, if that's too confusing, because it is to me sometimes. But we will, on the video, we'll have a banner that you can see. It's a little harder on the podcast. But thank both of you so very much. I think this topic is, is so important right now in our culture. It's so important for the church to know how to respond uh, in light of all the conversations that are going on. And thank you for you have shown us how to do that well, and I appreciate it so much. I appreciate yes, that. we we thank you for extending the message. Mm -hmm. Well, we invite all of our audience to uh, look at our other videos and podcasts at beyondordinarywomen.org. Uh, Dr. Glon has done some others for us. You can. You can look for her on our website and find those. And we just invite you to look for other things. And if you have ideas for other topics that you'd like to hear about, let us know. We're always interested in those.